<laughs> recording in progress. So we are now recording. If you don't want your image recorded, please uh, turn off your camera. So otherwise, please stay on mute unless you have a question. Hello, everyone. Uh, I know that most of you already know this, but we'll go ahead and do a somewhat formal introduction. I am the Honorable Lord Ian the Green, and today we're going to be learning about how to make capitals for Carolingian minuscule. Uh, we're going to be doing Lombardic capitals, and of course, we're going to do a really quick review um, about doing uncials as well, because that, those were the first capitals that were used for Lombardic, not for Lombardic, <laughs> for Carolingian. Um, one of the ways that you can date Carolingian roughly is to look at what capitals are being used. So if we assume that the start of Carolingian for the purposes of easy discussion is 800 AD, and actually it's a little before that, um, but 800 to 1000, you're going to be able to use uncial capitals pretty much almost from anywhere in that time period. Is that accurate? No, it's rough. There are places where they start doing the precursors to Lombardic or to Lombardic a little sooner than that, but nobody should fault you uh, for doing that unless you're working off a specific manuscript. If you are, well, then use what they used. No big deal. From about 1000 AD to 1100, maybe 1150, um, Lombardic is taken over. It's being used most places, some version of Lombardic. Now, again, time and place matters. Um, but Lombardic is kind of the second half. And then we start to get into um, late period, late Carolingian or late period, late period Carolingian, depending on who you talk to. You'll also hear it called Proto Gothic or Early Gothic. Carolingian minuscule is what morphs into the Gothic, Gothic script. And so the Gothic script originally was not this angular, compact thing, but the beginnings of it were making Carolingian minuscule more compact and more angular. And so we have that proto-Gothic that, that happens. And that happens dead definitively by 1200, and it kind of starts to happen around 1100, 1150, depending on who you want to talk to about it. And that actually starts because of the trade between uh, the European mainland in France, or what we now think of as France, and a little to the east of there, um, across the English Channel. And there's some discussion that goes on there. Purpose of this class, though, not that, but wanted to give you some, uh, you know, a little bit of extra information. So um, when we say Uncial was used as the capitals roughly from 800 to 1000, we're talking um, what the uncial that we learned uh, when we first started doing this class. It's the classic uncial that you're going to see uh, in the credits for a bunch of different movies, including uh, the, the um, Lord of the Ring movies. Um, it is not insular half uncial. It's not artificial uncial. It's really that classical uncial that we, that, that we see. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that uncial for a very long time was the only script that the Bible could be written in. It was the only script that was grandiose or holy enough to do so, depending on who you asked. But um, that's one of the reasons why Unshul stuck around so long and was being used as a capital. Um, and if you look at the uh, group's header that I use, you'll actually see stuff that was written uh, that way, even though side by side with Carolingian minuscule. And it's kind of fun to see that juxtaposition of the capitals um, on the right hand side of the page being written with Carolingian. And then what are the capitals being written over on the left hand side exclusively as Uncial? And so there are times and places you'll see that happening within the first hundred years or so um, of Carolingian. So, uh, any questions so far? All right. I'm going to assume most of you have a feel like you have a pretty decent handle on, on, on Uncial at that point then. So how do we deal with um, what came next, uh, Lombardic? So what we're going to do today is we're actually going to look at a manuscript. So please take a look in at the link. Take a look in chat. I just put a link in there. That link is actually to my blog. 
and it talks about it's the link to my blog about Carolingian minuscule. Um, at the very bottom, if you will quickly scroll down to the bottom uh, and stop where you see a link for Merton College Manuscript 160, that's MS 160. Go ahead and click and click on the Merton College MS 160 link, and that will take you to the script manuscript we're going to be using today. So I just kind of want to get that prepped. And yeah, we're going to start at folio 1R, just so that people know. Um, but before we deal with that, um, if you have, but go ahead and get to it. Uh, and when you're done with that, if you happen to have your Drogan book handy, Medieval Calligraphy, Its History and Techniques, um, I would like you to go ahead and, and turn to page 128. Uh, because he doesn't teach us how to do these capitals very well, but what he does do very well is teach us the technique that we're going to use over and over and over in it, with it. My Laurel very kindly <clears throat> purchased me some Pilot Parallel pens, and I because I have it, I, I do not get along well with uh, cartridge pens, and the Pilot Parallel pen is a cartridge pen. I get along really well with these, and so I don't have to pick up and dip, and so hopefully uh, I'll be able to do class a little bit faster. So you, sorry, can you give us the manuscript, where to find the manuscript link again? Okay, so click on the link on my blog, yeah. to my blog. Once you get to that blog page, it's going to be, it should take you to the one for Carolingian Minuscule. Yeah. Scroll about three quarters of the way down the page, and um, it should say Merton College MS 160, and it will be on the left hand side. It's the beginning of a paragraph. And on my computer, that's it's in blue. Ian, would you like me to show everybody? If you can, that would be wonderful. Okay, hold on. So, which means he's going to try and share a screen. Yeah, that's right. So just, just hold on for a second. Yep. And when I disappear, it's okay. I promise I'll still be here. All right. So. Here it is. This is MS-160. So that's the manuscript. Yep. And it looks like the top left tab there is the one to my blog. Can you hear me? All right. Looks like the screen share is not being done anymore. Okay. Were you able to find it? Well, they're still working on that. I'm going to start showing um, my version of how to do what Drogan tells us to do. Right. So capitals are not simple, easy writings. Um, capitals, even when they are are quick and easy. Their specific, their, their purpose in medieval writing is to get your attention. It is not necessarily to start a sentence. Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, so 
to get your attention, they're more complex or they're bigger or they're darker. Uh, and so the way that the Lombardic does that is to use the pen and go over strokes you've already made and make it thicker. In other words, it's essentially a way of doing bold. So we can look at C and E here real quick. And we have a lot of pen manipulation that's being done here. It's going to, you're going to use a 45 degree angle with your pen. And you're going to make that C. And you could do this at the same height as the rest of the letters. That's your X height right here. But you should probably do it at least a little bit bigger. And when you get to here, you literally take your pen and turn it on its bottom corner and pull down. Now, if you don't turn it on its bottom corner, turn it to a 60 and pull, pull down. Then, according to Drogan, and this is his steps, his order of operations. You're going to do this again, but now you're going to get wider and come out away from this. So if I do it from the other direction, it's going to be, you're going to come out, get wider, and then come inside. So where he wants you to do that is to more or less, as you start to come out of this thin area where you're at that 45 degree angle, come out about half a nib width and pull it back in. Now you may have noticed when I pulled it back in, I pulled it up a little too far and I have an extra point here. That's my fault. And then this one, I'm going to pull it this way, and then I'm going to use the go on edge again and go up. And so when I do that, I want to twist my wrist, not twist my fingers. Which I did. Or come down, come up with a 60, and come down like that. 60 is not the best way to do it. And you'll notice we have our C. However, it's not even. I didn't, this imaginary line that's supposed to go straight up here that we're supposed to meet, yeah, I didn't meet that. Even if I am, you know, doing that a little too much. I didn't meet it. So it's something to be careful about. Bring it around, up, turn your wrist, try and pull straight down. Come out, half an nib width, come back in. Try to stay inside of it. Come all the way over, turn your wrist again. Bring it up. Ah. Despite having practice this week, I'm still having some fun issues with it. And that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, the other thing that you can do, and that's a little bit more advanced, I'm gonna come over. Instead of just turning it, I'm actually going to twist my pen so that it does that and creates a flat. Then I'm going to pull it down. And you notice that this is ugly. That is not well formed. That's okay. Doesn't matter. I'm going to cover it up anyway. And then I come over this way, get that, and then now I'm going to twist that pen again 
lift my and then come up. And you can see how that changes the shape and it brings it more flat. And then if I didn't get it exactly flat, that's okay. And pull it up. Now, sometimes you'll see that they've been, they have this on them as well, or this. Um, he's not showing those, and these are very extended for the purposes of showing you in class how to do them. So if we do an E, Normally, when we do an E, we stick it at the 45 degree angle and pull it out. Don't. Put it at that 90. Pull it up a little, just a little. And then pull it down a little, just a little. And it kind of creates that little nose that we're used to seeing on the E. And that's an ugly looking E, but again, for the purposes of showing you and getting the movements. So doing it correctly, pull it down, come up, leave the pen there, twist it, come down a little. Overdraw that, make it thicker. Come up here, hit that imaginary line, twist that, bring it up. <clears throat> Any questions or comments or suggestions? Pull it out, come up just a little bit, go back in, pull it down, fill it in. Try and keep it flat. That's the trick. That's the hard part. And this is kind of the theme we're gonna do over and over again. You draw it, then you overdraw it, then you find a way to draw the eye up, down, or maybe to the sides a little bit. Is everybody on that page on the, was everybody able to pull up the uh, manuscript that I put in the links? Yes. Awesome. So I, the way he's showing I is also like a very simple way to start getting into N and things like that. Um, he starts out and it's very much uh, looks a lot like um, the old classic Roman eye. And so I come back, I come over, I come straight down, I come here and I do this. And that's essentially what he does. And then instead of keeping it nice and thin, I can come over here and keep my pen halfway out of that and then come over here. And I can do that to fill it in. And you notice how it has this divot in it. That's kind of the difference. That's the best difference I can find between the classic eye and then the eye that we're gonna get uh, from doing Lombardic is that we have this little divot at the top. And in theory, it should be here in the bottom too, but I kind of killed that. And so this really is more like drawing than it is like painting. There's also one of the reasons why I always say we are drawing calligraphy because all calligraphy is more like drawing than it is like writing. I know I said painting earlier, but I meant writing. And from that, you can fill out the end and do other things with it. Um, but I wanted to actually start getting into looking at the manuscript. 
So if you can, zoom in on folio 1R. That's page one on the recto. Recto means right, V is verso, meaning left. And you'll see in, in the top left, a rubrication. And it starts with the letter I, but that doesn't look anything like the letter I we just wrote. More than one way to do this. Uh, capitals, I, I don't wanna say this in a way that sounds terrible, but capitals are not as standardized as the minuscules tend to be. I think is the easiest, nicest way to say that. This I looks almost completely different. This I looks like a J that had a hook stuck on it. We're coming down, we start up tie, we come over here and we do this. And then I stick a hook on it. I have an eye, especially the way that one's done. I put a little tail here. That looks an awful lot like a tall S, doesn't it? Do the tall S thing. Come down this way. Bring that over. Put a hook on it. Congratulations. You have another form of an I. If we go down, there's a C. Just go down that, in, you know, on the, stay on the left hand side of that column. In the rubrication, we have a C. And it looks like it's saying capitula. That C looks a little bit like this. Here, come around. Stop. That and then on the inside, fill it in. And that's a way of doing the C. If you go down to the fourth line, we have a D there. And it's not the best form D, but it, it's a nice looking D. And for me, that looks an awful lot like the eye. We have that, that left side looks like the start of the eye. So, fill that in for the eye. Out, bring it down, bring it in, fix this a little bit. and then fill in that middle of the D on the inside. And then take the corner of your pen, fill it in. And if this is sticking down too far here, that's okay. You can fill that in. Not the best way to do it. And I much prefer to do it like this. I'm doing things out of the order that Drogan does it. But it gives me that opportunity to correct things if I need to. Ah, not entirely used to using these pens, but it's working pretty well. And they have it almost straight. So if I need, wanted to, I can go ahead and fill that in. 
Any questions so far? Comments or suggestions, welcome as well. Okay. And then we're gonna see two different, the, the, we're gonna see a different D. Now, we're gonna see two of them in a row. They're on lines bleh, two, three, four. Yeah, six and seven. That's a D. And those are certainly done by a pen. So, and it looks like a 45 degree angle pen at that. Stop just above the line of the, the baseline. Pull this over and up just a little bit. Bring this the top straight up or straight over. Maybe slight diagonal. And then down and in. And then you can put your hook in right there. Another way to do that is put your hook in. Bring this down to here. Start back here. Pull this up, come up, and then come straight down like that. Now this is too far over for what they did. And that's much more like it. And when they did that, they did it with black and then they came back with a different pen and pull the line straight down in red to help draw that attention. And then we have quad. Starts with the letter Q. In Latin, Q shows up a lot, especially as a capital. And that's a pretty simple Q, isn't it? It's an O with a tail on it. But it's not a big wide open O, is it? It's almost straight down. And then it comes up when it hits the bottom. And this comes over and then it comes down like that. And then we get a tail. And this cue has the fill in here. But then we see another cue down a little bit with the same word and the fill-ins over here. So does the fill-in matter? Maybe, maybe not. The difference between the different capitals that we're seeing with these big thick here, these are more, these are the Lombardic style. These are more the handwritten style. And this manuscript happens to be later and we're starting to head into um, what we're not there, but what it's kind of right before we get in, we're getting into Proto Gothic. And you can kind of see how some of that angularness of Proto Gothic is starting to develop. And so, when do you use which form of capitals? When do you use the Lombardic versus? these quicker, obvious pen, you know, ones. And the answer is, well, what do you want to do? It really is your choice where, you know, things that you want to draw a lot of attention to and how much money do you have and how much time do you have was also a consideration. Um, if you, you know, the more attention you want to draw, the more likely you are to use these Lombardic styles. If you still want to draw attention, you don't have a lot of time, don't have a lot of money, um, or you, and then you're going to switch over to these other kinds of capitals. And you're going to write them, and then you're going to come back, and you're going to put in that extra line with the with the rubrication. So we have a short S as a capital. Um, let's see what line is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Line twelve, uh, and it almost like it's it almost looks like it's talking about Solomon. In fact, it is talking about Solomon. That S is not like our, our modern S's in, in the way that 
it doesn't come all the way over. It doesn't, you know, meet this line that's supposed to be over here on the edge. That's okay, it doesn't have to. We come kind of straightish down, come all the way over and then make a curve. And then this, I see it as a connection here, just doing that. And then here to there. And a rubrication line there. Was Could you see that or was my hand in the way? Your hand was in the way. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can fix that this time around. So, move my hand out of the way, keep the pen where it needs to be. So this comes kind of a little bit over and then straight down about halfway. And then we bring it over and we curve down to the baseline. Come back up, put the corner, the bottom left corner of the pen here, right on top. I'm gonna to actually connect, I'm gonna to just touch it to the top there and I'm gonna pull it at a 45 degree angle about halfway. And then to do this one, I'm just gonna come over and then down in a curve. Is that better? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Now I'm not saying that's the way you have to do it. I'm saying that's the way it looks like it would work, a way that it would work. I'm right-handed. I don't think that technique will work for a left-hander. One of the one one of the letters that I love that is done over and over that you actually do again see a lot in um, Latin is the letter V. This V is showing off. It is saying, "Hello, look at me, look at me. I am the pretty V," and it really is. We're going to start up here. We're going to be swishy. We're going to come away from where we're supposed to go. Then we're going to go to where we're supposed to go, and then. We're actually going to go V. And then we're going to do this. Or maybe I'll start all the way up here, come over here, hit this, and I'll make a curve this way. A little too much of a curve. And I'll make it nice and wide and be over here. That V, by the way, is very much um, a Batard V, which is why I took it too far over. Batard's one of my favorite scripts, and my hand took over instead of what I was supposed to be doing. So I'll do it again. There. You notice it's a lot less curved. I'm not bringing it all the way over, but that's roughly where they did it. And then I start up here, and I bring it down, and that changes the look a lot. This, not the way to have done that. And then the rubrication follows here. Now, one of the things that I like about this page, let me see if I can find it real quick, just out of the, is it this page or a different one? Might be a different one. Um, it's done in two columns. We have a lot of Q, we have a lot of S. Ah, there's an A. I knew there was one. And there's a J, the J also looks like the I. Um, but if you look at the second column, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, thir line 13, of course, you get a capital A. And it's not pretty, but it works. It's kind of that first half of an O that gets brought up and then brought down 
and over. And it's reminiscent of the Carolingian A. Because Carolingian A is that. So this is, you can kind of see how these two might have, you know, come from one another. Any questions so far? Well, let's skip to folio 2R. We're going to see that E again, and we're going to see an F there, both of them done in the Lombardic style. Give people just a little bit more time to get to those. So if we look at the E that's done here, it's different than, than the E that we saw from Drogon, but in some ways it's very similar. Okay. Minimize, pull up. All right. So this E um, wants to do that bolding, that highlighting, that, hey, look at me on the inside. We're still going to make a nice curve. Pull it over, but we're going to stop there. I'm going to pull this one over, leave it at an angle and stop. And then on this inside curve, I'm just going to pull it down so it looks like that. If I don't fill that in, it starts to look like a gothic, doesn't it? But I'm going to go ahead and fill it in. And I get that fill in that you see in that Lombardic E that's on folio to recto. So now I've got to figure out how I want to deal with how these endpoints are, are put in. And if I pull this over like that, just like I did with before, I do okay. And if this one, I'm here and I pull it down and over as well, I now kind of have these roughly the way they look here. And this one, if I pull it out and come up, I'm pretty okay. And I just flatten that a little, it works even better. I can use the bottom of my, the corner of my pen and draw through and pull through and do it here as well. And by the way, yes, there are ones where you'll see they just pull all the way through like that. There we go. Does that make sense to people? Or is this a whole lot of, oh my God, Ian, what's going on? I'm going to assume things are okay. So let's scoot on down to the F. There's a lot going on or not going on with this F. It's uh, interesting. Now, if I was going to draw an outline of this F, it might look a lot like this.
ish. The way I would choose to draw this, I'm going to keep with my 45, which I don't need to. I think I'm going to switch it over to flat. So I'm going to pull there and then come here. Pull it up, pull flat down to there, and then I'm going to fill that in. It looks like they left some of this open, but it's okay if you fill it in all the way. I'm going to come off of this up this way, pull it down over, and then just play the connection game. And you can see why this was probably painted instead of pen work. two nibs, and then I can pull that down. And this probably should be longer. Again, this is probably painted, not pen work. And you can see why you need both. Chances, by the way, are also very good that this was painted in before the writing was put in. Rubrication was often done first, and, and any rubrication that was done with, with, you know, especially if it was going to be painted, was put in. They plan that well ahead when they're doing this. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Got to get these in there. And that's the neat thing is that you can always go back and, and fill in the mistakes that you've made, you know, for the mistakes that you've made. And this is too wide, but. And as you can see, Lombardi Capitals, as much as I love them, they're not my strong suit. So if I'm actually going to do a project with them, I spend a lot of time practicing these ahead of time. You'll also notice something else in this manuscript, though. Those other capitals that they were using all the time are almost gone. When we look at folio 2R and we compare it to folio 1R and 1V, those other capitals are just not being used anymore. And that's a choice. Now, why is that choice? I can't tell you exactly. I haven't studied this particular manuscript, but I can tell you when you are putting it on the capitals, you're showing, uh, you know, when you're doing it like this, you're making a list. You're showing off things in a very specific way. Now, that list may or may not be what we think of as a list today, but they were doing it as a way to, this is important, this is important, this is important, and they're sticking it up front. And then it's, okay, we may or may not even be starting a new paragraph, but we are starting a section here that says on, on 2R, um, we're starting a section here, and it's important that you pay attention to it. And so that's what these rubricated um, Lombardics are doing. If we go over to folio 2V, we get a V. These are fun to me um, because they really do look like an upside down A that doesn't have a crossbar. And we can actually draw that shape first. Pull this V here and fill it in. Do it again. Nice V. Turn on the corner, pull it down, and then I take this, twist my pen to about a 60, and pull that down. And then because I want to thicken it a little, I'll play with this until I get that line a little thicker. And that's sticking out now. I'd actually come back and scratch that and scrape that because I, I can't fix that with my pen. And if I try, I'll make it uglier and worse. 
We are at 50 minutes. Uh, this is where I normally say, hey, questions, comments, pitch in, say things, people. No comments in the chat. Yeah. Um, are we getting the idea and the sense of how Lombardic does what it does to different letters so that you would feel willing to try this without, you know, a, a ductus? If you need a ductus, page 128, Mark Drogan's Medieval Calligraphy, it's History and Technique. Um, he shows you some of that ductus stuff so that you can get it looking uh, and getting kind of the sense of how to make it the thicks and the thins the way that they would have done so. Um, if we want to switch back to that, um, I'm going to show you the G. Um, and this style of G actually turns into a style of G that you're going to use somewhat regularly in later scripts as a minuscule, um, but it is a capital at this point, not just a majuscule, but a, but a capital at this point. And basically, you're just kind of curling um, a, a C in on itself is a way to think of it. And again, it's gotta be bigger. This is our waistline, this is my baseline. So waistline and my baseline here. And I pull this around. And then to get the G, like it's a spiral. And then this can come out to here. And in later scripts, this can get pulled out all the way and all the other things, but that's not what we're dealing with right now. So we saw that you can make it thicker on the outside or you can straighten, you know, put it straight in here and thicken this. So my hand was in the way. Let me see if I can point that out a different way for you. So we've seen before, we can go on the inside and pull straight and make this nice thick bolt here, or we can be on the outside and pull around and make this thicker here. There's my actual pointer. Drogan, he always wants to work the outside. That's what Drogan wants. So we'll do it his way. Pull it out, half a nib width, a nib width, bring it back in. And then he does it up here as well, again, working the outside and pulling it back in. And then the G, he's gonna flatten this out. So we're here and we can twist our pen. And when we twist our pen that way, we get something that's not a flat. And I kind of, I, I want to point this out to you if I can. I know it's still wet, but do you see how this is slightly curved here? So we kind of have a point, we kind of have a point, and then there's a divot in here. And that's what that does. And that's how you know that the, scribe probably twisted their pen because it's not perfectly flat there. When you do this and then pull that, you get a little divot almost every time. And it is, I don't know of anywhere, any other way to make that shape quickly. Now, you can always draw something in. Um, and then when he does that, he also pulls this down just a little bit. Probably half a nib width, me to three quarters of a nib width. If we do it the other way and pull this and do this on the inside, pull this around, bring it up. That works there nicely enough. Pull this over, twist, pull it down a little. I don't think a straight here would work, but I think we might be able to thicken it on the inside and make it work just fine. Now, 
Which one's prettier? I leave that up to you. Personally, I, I like Drogon's way a little bit better, um, but both work. And I'm not gonna tell you that one is wrong or one is right. I'm gonna say you have some choices that you get to play with and figure out what you wanna do. And with that, I'm done with my instruction instruction uh, portion of the class. Happy to take questions. Hey, Ian, how would you do this? Um, comments, suggestions from anybody. Um, go ahead and pitch in. So it looks like there's a lot more pen manipulation going on here than on anything else we've done before. So there's lots of like it doesn't even on like the bottom half of the the capital G and a lot of the other ones, you know, it doesn't go kind of thick in the bottom left like it would if you're holding it at a straight 45 or 60. It, yep. it gets thin there. So I'm not quite sure how you pull that off just yet. But <laughs> just no practice. All right. So are you talking about this then? Here. Sorry, I'm muted. Um, it, if you look in Drogon, it tapers down where the thinnest part is at the very bottom of the G, where it, yeah, it tapers oh. down on the left side and it widens back out again. Yeah. Um, and he, what, what he's doing is, I'm going to keep it at a 45. Do I have my other bigger pen? I do. All right. There it is. I'm going to make it big, and hopefully that'll help show it off. We'll see. So this is a six millimeter wide uh, pen. The other one was two and a half millimeters. So more than twice as big. When I pull this around, that's gonna be my thickest point because I'm pulling opposite the 45. When I come up here, I get back to that 45 degree angle. And if I just keep going, I'm drawing a nice thin straight line. So with the G, we're going to ignore that nice thin straight line, but I want it there for the purposes of, of seeing things. So I come over here, roughly where that started and kind of put the middle of my pen there. And I pull this around and I want it to meet that corner. And I try and land inside of it. I still have that nice thin line. This, I'm gonna go ahead and pull over now. And I'm going to manipulate my pen by doing that. And I'm going to thicken the outside, as Drogan shows us. And I'm going to thicken the outside, as Drogan shows us. But I'm going to stop. There. Now, that is over showing you what's happening. But it's exactly what I did over here. Wrong thing I grabbed. I still have that thin line. But I think what Pierre is trying to say is, <clears throat> if you go to your new G that you just did with your parallel pen, and you go to the very bottom of the letter. Here? There. OK. You have thickened the line. When you look at Drogon on page 128, um... It's much thinner on the bottom. Yeah. And that, that I think was what Pierre was asking was that it looks thinner than you've made you a better form. Right. And that's because yeah. my pen. All right, let me show you what he did there. Thank you. Um, so yeah, pen angle matters mm -hmm. is the answer. So up here I said, well, we'll do a 45. Let me flatten this out. I'm going to go between zero and 20. Uh, okay, that that's the trick. It's, the only it's, difference it's, was pen angle. Zero to twenty is why why it looks so thin at the bottom. And this is why at the very beginning of, of this back in March, April, we harp so heavily on getting pen angle correctly. Pen angle changes how your stroke works and it changes how things connect 
And as you can see, there's a vast difference in where the heaviness of the letter goes. This much thicker, much heavier than this, even though I, I went ahead and went over it again, just like I did here, but now it's much thinner here and much thinner here. The only thin points are here and here on this one. It changes your pen angle, completely changes how your letter looks. So does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. That that explains a lot of it because yeah, I couldn't couldn't make my letter look like Drogan at all. But now that knowing it's because my pen was wrong is explained. Well, I wouldn't say wrong, just different than what he was using. What I will say though is, when I don't remember if you guys, how many of you remember me saying capitals get messy. And when I said that, what I meant was, there's very little your pen is going to stay at this angle all the time when you're doing capitals and i don't care what capitals you're working on in any script um there are some exceptions but for the most part you're going to do a lot more pen manipulation you're going to put your pen at different angles you're going to twist your pen in ways that you just wouldn't when you're writing the minuscules because that's capitals um uh, other comments suggestions or questions yeah, we need to wrap it up. We're almost at an hour, so. Yeah. Okay, well, if people want to continue on, we'll, uh, we can do that after we stop uh, the recording.